we will begin with the ICI motor song. So may I please request everyone to stand up for the ICI motor song. A gentle reminder to put all your devices on mute, please. Yeshu Jagrati Yeshu Sukte Shu Jagrati Kamam 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 Sho Sho Nirmi Mana Nirmi Mana Adeva Shukram Adeva Shukram Good evening and welcome, esteemed guests, patrons, professional colleagues, and my fellow members. Thank you all for joining us today this evening as ICI Singapore chapter brings to you an evening of discussion on business valuation essentials. Through our expert speakers, we will delve a deeper into the topic of valuation, the strategies which impact and enterprise value, and how to assess them as an investor as well as investee. Unfortunately, our chief guest for today, Dr. Shilpak Ambule, High Commissioner of India for Singapore, could not join us due to some urgent matter. He has sent his best wishes for this event. We are joined by Mr. T. Prabhakar, First Secretary Commerce, and Mr. Sanyam Joshi, First Secretary Economics from the High Indian High May I now request our Chairman, Mr. Somnath, and Vice Chairman, Mr. Nishan, to come up on stage for their welcome address. Good evening respected keynote speaker and special guest for tonight, Professor Rashwat Damodaran, NYU Stern School of Business. Officials from the Indian High Commission, distinguished speakers, managing committee members, friends, and guests. Thank you. Thank you for your presence tonight. This is our final professional event for this calendar year, 2023. And it could not have been bigger and better than this one, a star-studded mega evening. It is my utmost pleasure in welcoming you all to this mega event tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Soom. I'll start with a couplet. So in this gathering of minds and prestige, in this gathering of minds and prestige, welcome where excellence takes center stage. And for you, sir, in this realm of expertise, where ideas take flight, your presence elevates, making our event bright. This event is also special because we are celebrating 75th foundation year of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. We have a packed program ahead of us, so let us sit back and soak ourselves in the wisdom 
with this back to M3s. Yes. Thanks, Mahesh. So, dear members of the Institute and uh, guests, my name is Mahesh Venkatraman. Uh, I've been asked to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, not an easy task to introduce somebody who's a legend in the field of valuation. An alumnus of Loyola College, Madras University, I am Bangalore, with an MBA and PhD from UCLA. Professor Damodurun has been an academic for over 30 years now. His valuation classes and corporate finance classes at NYU Stern, uh, I'm told, run to full pack capacity. And uh, his research papers and his books are widely quoted. Um, not just used by students alone, but by practitioners like myself as well. He's the pioneer of internet-based learning. And thanks to him, a number of us who probably never had the opportunity to attend uh, Stern uh, School of Business managed to attend his lessons and lectures virtually. So I call him the original pioneer of internet-based learning, much before the new newbies came on stage. Um, this was the first book that I read on corporate finance. And subsequent to that, uh, there's been many books. Um, and even now, every year, I was saying to some people, it's a, it's a tradition to log in to the classes and look at what's latest that about and the new and the latest companies is valuing and get his views. Well, that's my fanboy moment. Uh, without further ado, uh, it's my privilege and my honor uh, to welcome our keynote speaker for today, Professor Ashwat Damodaran, to the dais. I have absolutely nothing prepared. Um, that said, though, I mean, I, uh, uh, I am honored, flattered to be called. No. I, I, there's a little bit of story behind this dean evaluation stuff that you see on CNBC. You want to know the real story? About a decade ago, I was on CNBC, and this anchor could not get my name right. right? <laughs> He tried and he tried and he said, you know what, I give up. I'm just going to call you Dean. So it wasn't because I was somehow knew more about valuation. He just wanted a shortcut to getting my name right. Yeah. And, um, and I want to start off by telling you that I don't take myself too seriously. Let's face it, valuation is addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. It's common sense. Okay? And I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be in a discipline where knowing a little bit makes you an expert, but that's pretty much how I think about valuation. I'm just one step ahead, you know, if I try than most other people because I do think about it a lot. But, you know, I was, you, know you talked about my research papers. I haven't written a research paper in almost... 22 years now that I've written, submitted to publication. Life's too short. I to write research papers. You know the median number of readers for an Econometrica? Econometrica is one of the leading journals in economics. You know the median number of readers for an Econometrica journal article is seven. You spend years of your life writing stuff that seven people read. You know? Of course, it gives you credit in the echo chamber of academia, but I gave up on that 20 years ago. In fact, if people ask me what I do, I call myself the Kim Kardashian of finance, which is I'm going for social media presence, and uh, as long as I have more Facebook followers and Twitter, follow, you know, uh, Twitter followers and LinkedIn followers than my kids, I'm way ahead of the game. Right? I'm a teacher. That's all I am. I mean, I, that's what I do. I don't consult. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a researcher. I'm a teacher. So as I think about topics to talk about, are you all accountants? I am so sorry for you guys. 
but that's because you know I, I, I think about when I start my corporate finance classes. You know, my corporate finance class is a class my first year MBAs. If it looks like I'm crying, it's because the jet lag is catching up in my eyes. No. Um, I start off the class because they often come in, you know, as you know, MBA programs have changed over the last 36 years. I came to Stern in 1986, and MBA class was primarily investment bankers coming, up, coming back after two years. Today, investment, you know, my MBA class are incredibly diverse in terms of background. I'm museum directors, I'm a basket, professional basketball player. A lot of people from very different places, and many of them are not, in, not even not from finance, they're not from business. They come into an MBA program, they have the first semester where they take core classes, including an accounting class, and the second semester of the first year, they come into my corporate finance class. And the only class that they think is finance related is an accounting class. And I have to spend the first session decontaminating them. <laughs> and making them stop think like, thinking. So don't take this personally. I start with the accountant's favorite financial statement. The balance sheet. Accountants are the only ones left in the world who actually think balance sheets matter, right? <laughs> so they play elaborate games and they dance elaborate dances around balance sheets when the truth is nobody really cares outside of you, right? And I contrast with the financial balance sheet. So let's use the contrast because I think it cuts to the heart of why fair value accounting is an oxymoron. You can either do accounting or you can do valuation. You try to do both, you will do both badly. And accounting is doing a really good job of screwing it up by trying to do both. Right? Let's start with the accounting balance sheet, right? Look at the assets out of the balance sheet. You got current assets. It's a rule there, you know, basically because you've not your inventory was, you know, recent. Your receipt things are pretty close to current value. Then you've got long-term assets, fixed assets. Much as you dance around the game, this is still in much of the world built around what you originally paid for that asset. Net of what you claim has happened to that asset, this concocted depreciation you've done over time, double decline, single, whatever depreciation. So it's basically original book value, net of what you think has happened. Already you can see two sets of rules too. Then you have financial assets. And there God only knows what you do, right? You have cross holdings in companies. If I hold it for trading, you mark it to market. If I hold it to, for whatever else, you kind of leave it at book value, which means that I have to know what you're doing before I can use that number. And then you have intangible assets. You guys are very fond of that, right? You're big on, can I see it? Can I not see it? If I don't see it, what the heck do I do with it? And this obsession with intangible assets drives me crazy. And the reason is simple. It's not because I don't think intangibles matter. Obviously, the greatest companies in the world today, the bulk of their value comes from things you can't see, right? Apple, Microsoft. So I agree with you. Intangibles are a big deal, and accountants have talked the good talk with intangibles. But just a few months ago, ahead of uh, valuing Birkenstock, which I will talk about in a few minutes for their IPO, I wanted to look at what accountants showed as intangible assets. So I, I downloaded every publicly traded company. And this is an advantage you have now you didn't have 50 years ago. This was easy, right? I have capital IQ. I downloaded what you called intangible assets in every publicly traded company in the world. And I looked to see what kinds of intangibles were in there. And you know what the dominant intangible was, the one item that accounted for 85% of intangibles. You can name it. What is it? Goodwill. The most destructive item ever created in accounting history. And here's why. For goodwill to manifest itself in a balance sheet, a company has to do something, right? Tell me what it is, because already I can start digging through some accounting. It has to? 
feels no, before that, you got to take an act, which is you got to buy another company. If you're the greatest company in the face of the earth and you do it entirely with internal investment, there will be no goodwill on the balance sheet. Apple has very little goodwill. Buy. Ne so the minute you do an acquisition, goodwill pops up. And what does it measure? The difference between what was paid and... No, 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 no. You, you, I, I know you use words like fair value and what it's worth, but it's book value dressed up. And dressing up book value is like dressing up a turkey. Right? That scrawny neck is really tough to cover up. It's dressed up book value. So if I have a company with a book value of $4 billion and somebody pays $10 billion, you guys have a $6 billion problem to explain away. Why? Because until yesterday you told me the book, the value is, and somebody's offering 10 billion. You say, what do I do? You take the six billion dollar difference, and you call it goodwill. Why do you need it? Because the balance sheets have a very unpleasant requirement, right? Which is, they have to balance. Goodwill exists for one reason and one reason alone. Your balance sheets need to balance. But do you know what the problem with goodwill is? It sounds good. And if something sounds good, people feel the urge to pay for it. You know what I mean? You're so, you'd be surprised how many emails I get every week from people saying, I've just finished valuing a company, but there's three billion of goodwill on the balance sheet. Should I add it on? I say, out of your mind. Are you out of your mind? But you can see why the urge exists. Every year I send suggestions to the accounting rule writers. They never seem to take me up on my suggestions. It's about a decade ago, I sent a suggestion. Let's rename Goodwill. Let's call it X. You know how in algebra when two numbers don't match up, you put in an X, you can make any two numbers match up. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a more honest description of what that is on the balance sheet? X, six billion. Nobody would feel the urge to add X on, but you guys called it Goodwill. People said there must be something magical. There's nothing there. And things got only worse. Every time accountants try to do things better, they create a whole host of messes with the rest of us, right? Until about two decades ago, you had goodwill. You, what did you do? You automatically wrote off 140th of it each. That was so much better than what you do now, which is you have this elaborate. It keeps a lot of accountants employed. So I'm not complaining about it for you, from you, for your sake. But every year, the accounting team lands up at your company. They do a kabuki dance around tables. They take about three months. They cost you about a few million dollars. In the end, they say, you know what? We impaired your goodwill. I've never mind. What exactly does that mean? You know what impairment means, right? It's an admission that you screwed up. This morning, I was reading that uh, Procter & Gamble is impairing goodwill from their acquisition of Gillette. You know when that happened? 2006. Now you're telling me that they overpaid then? What the heck am I supposed to do with that? And why do I care? Because the response you get from accountants is it's information that nobody cares about. You know the market reaction to impairment of goodwill is? Zero. Because by the time it happens, everybody on, on the face of the earth knows you already overpaid. Because how do you impair goodwill? You look at the pricing of stocks in that sector, they're down 30%. You basically knock down. The, you, I don't need you know, KPMG to come in and tell me this. I knew this two years ago. Now you're coming around to it. We've paid good well. Good. So that's the asset side of the balance sheet. Let's go to the liability side. You like breaking things down into detail. You can tell the age of a firm by how many items there are just on the balance sheet, right? It seems to have babies and so, you know, basically you create new items. You have current liabilities, you have accounts payable, supply credit, deferred this, deferred that, deferred everything under the sun. Then you've got long-term debt, you've got corporate bonds, and then you have shareholders' equity. It sounds glorious. Until you take a closer look at it. You take Coca-Cola, you look at the shareholders' equity. What's in there? Everything that has happened to the company over its history. It's the ultimate backward-looking number, right? If I were writing it mathematically, it would be what Coca-Cola raised in its IPO. And was that, God only knows, a century ago. And a summation of all retained earnings since, and now with buybacks, summation of everything you... It's the ultimate backward-looking number. So that's how I start my MBA class. I said, this is what an accounting balance sheet is. 
And here's how accountants think. Tell me if I'm wrong. Accountants are historians. That's what comes naturally to them. They back, they look backwards. Accountants are rule driven. Don't tell me you're not. All you have to do is look at the latest FAS rule, look at the number on the rule. I remember when fair value accounting was writing its rules and the rule writers had asked me whether I'd come in and talk to them about what they were doing. And I said, are you sure you've got the right guy? Because you know what I think about fair value accounting. I said, no, no, we want you to come in. So this was 20 years ago when you know, Gap was trying to get you know, the, the... So I said, can you send me the, the rule that you've written to drive fair value accounting? And they sent me this rule called FAS, I mean, it was FAS 157. My reaction is, the 156 other rules I've never even heard about. That, you know, I, I'm terrified already. Accountants, when in doubt, write rules. They think having more rules creates more precision. It's rule driven and it's backward looking which are the exact opposite of what you should be thinking about in valuation. I have a financial balance sheet. Financial balance sheet is only two items on the asset side of the balance sheet. Assets in place, investments you've already made as a company, and growth assets, which is a value that I attach to things I think you will do in the future. I'm giving you credit for investments you haven't even thought about yet. You say, why would I do that? We do it all the time in markets, right? When you invest in NVIDIA, why are you paying $800 billion for this company? Because you expect them to do magical things in AI and you attach a value. Now do you see why fair value accounting, even if you do it right, can never get off the ground? Because all you can do is fair value assets in place. And even that's questionable, whether you... But, the growth assets can never show up. So if you're thinking book value would somehow be a competitive market value, which some accountants are delusion enough to believe, it's never going to happen. Growth, it's an amazingly simple way to think about companies because it's, I don't care if it's tangible or intangible. Have you done it already or do I expect you to do in the future? One of my favorite devices in my class is the notion of a corporate life cycle. That companies like human beings are born. A startup is like a baby. Needs constant care, attention, in the case of a startup, capital. A very young company is like a toddler. Falls, gets up, sometimes falls and doesn't get up, you know. But, you know. With a huge mortality rate, right? Two out of three startups don't make it so. You make it through those years the few that succeed, you become a teenager. Teenage companies behave just like human teenagers. I don't know how many of you have teenagers at home, but I think it's every teenager's job to get up every morning, look in the mirror and say, I have lots of potential. What can I do today to screw it all up, right? Because their time horizon is what? 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, beyond that. I mean, this is why somebody who gets into Harvard then gets on social media, posts something incredibly stupid, and loses his Harvard sport. So what were you thinking? He wasn't. He was a teenager. When I bought Tesla in 2019, after one of their many you know, ups and downs, this was a down. Now, it dropped to 180. This was after Elon sent out that tweet about funding, you know, secured. Every word in the tweet happened to be false, and the company kind of imploded. Stock was at 180, and I valued it then. And for the first time in my experience valuing Tesla, I found it to be undervalued. I bought the stock, and I wrote about it on my blog, and I described it as my corporate teenager. I said, look, I'm buying the stock with open eyes. This is not a stock where you lie back and you let it go. It is a stock that, like my teenager, every day, one man is going to wake up and he's going to say, what can I do today to screw it all up? Maybe I'll tweet about a Thai diver. What were you thinking? Or about buying Bitcoin. What were you thinking? You got one of the great automobile stories of all time. What the heck are you doing buying a billion dollars of Bitcoin? But I said, complaining about it is silly because you're getting the package. This is the package. An incredible visionary who gets lots of distractions. It is who he is. I said, I'm buying my corporate teenager. 
And then after the corporate teenage years come the peak of your life. I'm under, I should wrap up. Okay. I'm very close. Peak of your life. You know what you do? You can go to bed at three, wake up at six, and be a fully functioning human being. Don't try that. You know, most of you, you try that. It's, you're, not, you're not at the I mean, peak of the life that's, you know, tw in your 20s. You can do that. You can't do that much later than that. Companies, the peak of their age, everything they touch turns to gold. And then you become a mature company. That's like being middle-aged. Who looks forward to being middle-aged? I mean, how many of you, you know, when you were 10, said, I, I can't wait to be middle-aged? This is the, the part of your life you want to completely skip, right? But enjoy middle age because worse things are coming down the pike at you because after middle age comes old age and after old age comes dementia and after dementia comes death. And you know, that's how companies go through. And my financial balance sheet captures that, right? If you have a young startup, almost all of your value comes from growth assets. You look at a balance sheet for a young startup, it's almost meaningless. Your book equity is negative, there are no assets. What's the point of even looking at it, right? As companies age, you are going to see more substance because you're capturing assets in place, less of the value. And you know, your peak period as an accountant is for mature companies with things away, then at least your book value and your market value have a chance at least of being closed. And then you're going to decline and all bets are off again. So as we think about valuation, I think what I would encourage you to do as accountants is get out of the accounting mindset. Less rules, more first principles. Less backward looking, more forward looking. You know, less rigidity, more adaptability. And the problem is that the accounting rule writer is actually pushing in the opposite direction. The rules you're seeing written for fair value accounting are actually rules that will make value worse and there's, a, there's also a fundamental problem. This morning in my valuation class, I talked about the contrast between valuing something and pricing something. We know what drives value, cash flows, growth, and risk. How do you price something? You look at what other people are paying for similar things. Have you had a chance to look at FAS 157 and the equivalent in IFRS? Your, your mission in fair value accounting, at least as described by accountants, is to attach numbers to assets based on what that asset will get in an arm's length transaction from a buyer. Hey, what does that sound like? A value mission or a pricing mission? That's a pricing mission. I've always believed that fair value accounting should be called fair price accounting. And you can't do a discounted cash flow valuation to back up a pricing. It's got to be based almost entirely on multiples and comparables. The problem is, I don't think the accounting rule writers understand the difference between value and price. So what they do is they give you a fair price mission and then they ask you to do a DCF to justify it. And God help you. Because you're going to be doing all kinds of kabuki dances trying to get to that price that you want for Ola to show up on your balance sheet. So I think there's, there's, there's you know, we need to step back and think about common sense. And that requires abandoning some of the things that made you accountants. And think more like, you know, this, this value comes from the future. It doesn't come from the past. It doesn't come from rules. It comes from principles. And you've got to give people the freedom, the flexibility to adapt to the circumstances, which means fewer rules, more principles. If you could just take one of the seats. Okay. So we'll now have a fireside chat moderated by Soam. Fair warning, I did tell Soam, does the professor know he's going to walk into a room full of accountants? For those who attended the lectures, will know this was not new. But uh, I'd love to hear the conversation now. Over to you. Do we have a microphone? microphone? Yeah. Need one more mic. I think a couple of confessions before we begin. Number one, I think you know this is an honor to be on this stage with you, sir. Okay. So, Professor Rashford Damodaran. Number two, by far, I feel this is the toughest job that has been given to me tonight. So I'll see what I can do. But I can tell you this, sir. On behalf of the ICA Singapore chapter, 
We are extremely delighted that you are here with us this evening and we are experiencing it live. So thank you so much for that. We have a range of topics to cover and we'll you know, try to get to it quickly. My first question to you, sir, is on storytelling. We as CAs are very good with numbers. Where we you have emphasized on the fact that you know, we should understand the company's narrative more than anything else. So can you share a little bit more about that? For example, you, know, you, you compared the story of Amazon to uh, the, the field of dreams, for example. So share with us something on that and help us try to conquer the struggle between the left mind and the right mind. You know, I'll give you the origins of, because you know, I have one of my books is Narrative and Numbers. I did sign it for somebody just now. And I'll give you the origins for why I wrote the book and why I've made this so much a part of my class. This morning when I was uh, team teaching my evaluation, I'm teaching a two-day evaluation seminar, and, you know, I was talking to the group about the, my very first valuation. I did it in 1981. And I talked about the process I went through to value the company. I said I wrote to the company, physically wrote to the company, asking them to send me an annual report in the mail. I remember telling, telling this to my kids, and they said, why don't you go online and download? 1981, there was no online to download. No. And uh, so I wrote to the company to, and, they, and to give the company credit, two weeks later I got the annual report in the mail. I opened the annual report, and here's what was on my desk to value the company, a ledger sheet. How many of you have seen a ledger sheet? It's a blank sheet of paper with lines drawn through. I love the fact that the lines were already drawn through because I could never get them straight. Okay. But it's a blank sheet of paper. A calculator, very early stage calculator, which is the kind of calculator you get for free now when you subscribe to something, right? Addition, subtract, and I know it might have been a raise to the power, which I thought was a great innovation. And a pencil. I learned very early that pens don't work because you start entering numbers in pen and then you change your mind, everything has to get scratched out. And I valued the company, I don't even remember what the company was. Just two weeks ago I valued Tesla. I went to their website, I downloaded every single annual report the company had ever released in its life. They're all on the website, 2008 through 2023, took all of five minutes. Then I went to S&P Capital IQ, which I have access to, which is a global database, and downloaded 80 accounting line items for every single publicly traded automobile company in the world for the last 10 years. Took another 10 minutes. I have Excel, I have, you know, I have tools I could not even have dreamed about. So I have, and this is true for almost everybody. We have more data than we ever could have dreamed about having 40 years ago and more powerful tools. If I just pause there, this is good news, right? Valuations must be getting so much more sophisticated, so much better than they used to be. And I've been an observer of valuations now for 40 years. I've seen, I know I track banking valuations, private equity, venture capital, though venture capitalists can't value anything, they can price everything. So basically, you know, valuations across the spectrum. And in my experience, the quality of valuation has become worse rather than better. So about a decade ago, I started thinking about hey, what's missing. We have better data, we have more powerful tools. Why aren't valuations getting better? And the answer, I think, is we've let the tools take over. Most valuation classes have become modeling classes. You become an Excel ninja. You learn the keystrokes, it'll make every other line a different color. Congratulations. That really does wonders on your value. And I said, what? And I think what, we've miss, what we're missing, what we've forgotten, is when you value a company and enter inputs, whether you like it or not, you're telling a story about a company. I do this exercise in my class. I take somebody who's a pure number crunch who's done an Excel spreadsheet valuation of a company. And I take the Excel spreadsheet and I read it as a story back to them and say, is this the story you meant to tell? They say, no, no, that's not the story. Well, that's what your Excel spreadsheet is telling me. I'll give you an example. A company that has a 30% growth rate every year sees its margins go from 12% to 22%. 
implicitly are telling me a story of a big and growing market where competition is going to be weak, right? Implicit in that. I say, is that the story? And many people are surprised by the stories that their own valuations are telling. So when you value a company and you input those numbers that drive the value, whether you like it or not, you're telling a story, you might as well flesh out what that story is and make sure you buy into your own story, right? Even if other people don't, you have to buy your own story. And in the process, sometimes you're going to realize your story doesn't make sense. Which to me should be a red flag. Or go back and revisit your numbers because your numbers don't match what you think is a reasonable story. So I, I, I wrote the book, Narrative and Numbers, to talk about making stories explicit, how every valuation starts with a story. And I used a five-step process. I value Uber, I value Amazon, I value my, no, the five-step process. The five steps are my, my steps. I need them because I'm a natural number cruncher. I have to force myself to tell stories because otherwise, my natural inclination is to open the spreadsheet, start doing the valuation, and I have to stop that. And it didn't come naturally to me. First time I tried to tell a story, I remember it was the early 90s. It was like pulling teeth. It's not going to come easily if you're a natural number cruncher. And many of you, I would love to say natural number crunches, but you're Indian. You're accountants because your parents wanted you to be accountants. You might have wanted to be poets, and your mother, your father said, what the heck are you thinking? Poets make no money. Accountants do. But I assume that you became accountants because you like numbers. You're comfortable with numbers. If you're more naturally number crunches, that means you're not that comfortable telling stories. But it's a craft. Each time you do it, you will get better. That's the good news. I'm not going to say I'm a natural storyteller now, but it's easier for me to do it now than it was 10 years ago. Each time I do it, I think it gets a little easier. And you're going to discover that it makes you, your valuations have soul. I mean, I, no, it's not the word you, no. Your valuation will have a soul and a story. And you know what? The history of humanity, human beings remember stories a lot better than they remember numbers. I ran an exercise in my class where I showed them an Amazon Excel spreadsheet valuation. And I showed them the numbers. I lead them through the growth rates and the margins. And then I tell them a story. And five minutes later, I come back and say, do you remember what growth rate I used in my Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> Nobody remembers. You remember what margins I told? Nobody remembers, but they all remember my story. The field of dreams story, and the reason I picked that is, field of dreams, of course, is the is a movie, and it's a movie that had a wide, re you know, many younger people might not have seen it, but it's a movie where, you know, Kevin Costner, I think, builds a baseball field in the middle of one of the Midwestern states, Iowa, somewhere uh, in the middle of cornfields. And he finishes building the baseball field. His neighbor, who probably lives 10 miles away because these are farms, comes over and says, what the heck are you doing? Building a baseball field in the middle of nowhere. One of the most famous lines in movie them. He says, if we build it, they will come. He's saying, what's this got to do with Amazon? If there's one theme that if you think about Amazon all through its life, that's been the theme. We build it, they will come. Build what? If we build revenues, profits will come. You know, it's got patience built into its DNA, kind of captures the company. In fact, until 2012, that was my driving story. In 2012, I took another look at Amazon and said, this isn't a field of dreams company. It's a disruption machine. Because what's Amazon's business? Any business that it, it sees that looks soft, right? That's basically what Amazon targets. It'll go after any soft business. So if you're in a soft business, I'd look over my shoulder constantly. What are soft businesses? Soft businesses are businesses that are big, where everybody's unhappy. The providers are unhappy because they don't think they make enough money. The consumers are unhappy. Do you know businesses like that? No, I know lots of them. Banking. Who's happy in banking? Bankers complain about how diff difficult the business is. 
banking consumers acted and they said, why are you in the 20th century still? It's ripe for a disruptor, right? Education, who's happy? Universities complain that they always lose money. They always seem to lose money. The faculty are unhappy. The students are unhappy. It's only a matter of time. Amazon University. It's coming. And I won't shed a tear for traditional universities when it happens. Disruption machine. Okay. Store, I mean, when I think of Netflix, I think of a one of those uh, hamsters on a wheel that cannot get off. It's on a, it's a hamster on a wheel, right? Because it's built this machine of, we're going to add subscribers. How do you add subscribers? You have to make more content. And as it becomes global, it's got to add content. I mean, I, when I open up Netflix, half the shows I see are from India. So basically, they must see this as a big, this is their only growth market left. There's no way you get off that hamster on a wheel. Their biggest problem is they spend so much on content that even if they add subscribers, they can't figure out a way to make money on a consistent basis. So when you look at companies, think about the traditional financial data. But think about what's the story that best describes. And it's an incredibly useful device if you run the company, right? Because your job as a CEO is not to come up with marketing details, but to tell the story for your company in a way that you convince investors, convince employees about that story, and then act consistently on that story. It's what Jeff Bezos did so well that allowed Amazon as much breathing room as they did. So I know it took way too long, but no. And we're just loving to, um, we love listening to your anecdotes. Excellent. So we'll, we'll hold on to that term you just used, craft. We have used, uh, or we have heard this term called valuation is more art than science. But Professor, you just mentioned it's a craft. It's like building a bridge for the present to the future. So could you share a little bit more about that? And I think you mentioned about the five-step process, which includes the feedback loop. Can you tell us more about the 3P test? The 3P test is, is a te because when you tell a story, especially if you like a company, you can tell all kinds of stories, right? You can tell fairy tales. But you're trying to value a business, not tell a fairy tale. You're not, you can't create three-headed dogs like J.K. Rowling did and Harry Potter and get away with it in a business because dogs have one head. Now, unless you have a dog at home that has three heads, I'd love to see it. Now, so one of the tests I run to make sure that I haven't ahead of myself told a fairy tale is I stop and ask the question, is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Sounds like I'm playing on words, right? But I'll give you a very simple example of the contrast between the, those words. Possible is, is the easiest test. Basically, you just have to show that somebody's done something like this before. Plausible means that you've tried it somewhere and it's worked. Probable means you can go further and say, this is what it'll look like scaled up. So about six years ago, I was in Latin America and I was doing this three-city tour. And day one, I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil, with 300 Brazilians in the room. And say day two, I was in Lima, Peru. You know, and day three, I was in Santiago, Chile. Or actually, Chile came second and Lima came third. So first day I'm in Brazil and I, this, I'm doing this narrative numbers. I do a two-hour session and connecting stories, numbers, in the five-step process. And I get to this 3P test and I say, you know, as I, you know, as I was thinking about how to prepare this for this Brazilian audience, I wanted to pick a topic that every person in the room would have a point of view on. So with 300 Brazilians in a room, what's the one thing you can pick as a topic where every person's going to be interested. What are Brazilians crazy about? Football. It was six months before the 2018 World Cup. So I asked, is it possible that Brazil will win the World Cup? You asked 300 Brazilians six months before a World Cup. Is it possible that Brazil will win the World Cup? The answer is, of course, yes. We won it five times before. I said, okay. And I said, is it plausible that Brazil win the World Cup? Now, if I'd asked this question in December of 2014, the room would have been shaky. 
For those of you who don't track football or follow football, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But there was a World Cup in 2014 in Brazil. Does anybody remember what happened in that World Cup? In the semifinal, Brazil played Germany. One of the great shellackings of all time, they lost 8-2. It's kind of that black moment in Brazilian history they tried to forget. So they were shaky after that. But by 2017, they were feeling pretty good. They said, yeah, you know what? It's plausible. We're second ranked in the world. Then I said, is it probable that Brazil won the World Cup? And now you could see the wheels go into motion. We're put in the right group and Neymar stays healthy and this happens and this happens. You can win the World Cup. That's basically possible, plausible. I, it works so well in Brazil that I decided to use it in, in Santiago the next day. I should have done my homework, but I get to Santiago and said 200 Chileans in the room. I said, is it possible that Chile will win the World Cup? And what happened? Half the room started weeping, grown men weeping. And I said, what the heck did I do? It turned out that the week earlier, Chile had played Argentina, had lost to one, had been knocked out of World Cup contention. <laughs> and I think one of the things that you need to win the World Cup is you actually have to be there, right? Yeah. So it turned out that it was not, I didn't have the heart to ask, is it plausible, is it probable? <laughs> but remember, when you listen to a founder story and you ask a question, you very quickly realize it's a fairy tale. There's no point following up and say, what cost of capital did you use? You're telling a fairy tale, you can do whatever you want. I'm gonna let you get away with it. So possible, plausible, and probable is really a way of taking stories and making sure that the stories pass basic business tests that you've not been carried away. In fact, in my, when I teach my valuation class, one of the assignments that everybody in the class has is every week, they have to watch at least one Shark Tank episode. Okay. Is there an Indian version of Shark Tank yeah, now? Yeah. Right. So you know how Shark Tank works. There are five sharks, you know, venture capitalists, you know, private successful investors, and you have people presenting business ideas that they then ask, you know, 20% for 20 million, whatever it is. So, but my students are required to pause because most Shark Tank episodes now are just recorded. You can pause after the founder tells their business story and think of three questions they can ask the founder to decide whether the story that's being told is possible. It's a great exercise. Try it out. It, makes you think about what are the questions I would ask a founder to decide whether it's a fairy tale, whether the fairy tale has legs, whether it's plausible. If it's plausible, what are the things I would ask to be, you know? And I think it's, it's an exercise we have to constantly go through with our own stories. Because the human capacity for self-delusion lies deep. And we really, really like something. I call these runaway stories. You stop asking questions. No, I, in my class, I use the Theranos example. You have a 19-year-old who claims to have invented a new way to test, you to run a blood test with drops of your blood, not, not buckets of your blood, and it's going to do it for $45. You want that person to succeed. You stop asking questions, then what do you have? You have Theranos. I mean, what if I told you I'm going to start a real estate business where I'm going to lease buildings for 20 years and then sublease them for three months apiece? If you're a real estate person, what's your, what's your reaction to that? That's a dumb idea. It's never worked. You know why it doesn't work? Because you've got a duration mismatch made in hell, right? In good times, you fill the building. In bad times, everybody empties out. But think of a company that got priced at $90 billion which did exactly that, right? Scaled up a hundred times. I mean, I drove by the WeWork building in Singapore. It still has the WeWork name. I guess the bankruptcy hasn't found its Singapore, way there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this was a business that got to the verge of going public at a $90 billion pricing. And the only reason was, was backed up by somebody that people thought was such a genius that if he did it, then Good sense didn't matter, right? He must have seen a way to get around the duration mismatch. I'm, of course, talking about Master Son, who's got, got a God complex. I mean, who makes 300-year plans, right? People with God complexes. That's not a good quality to bring to the game if you're thinking about, is it possible, is it plausible, is it probable? 
Wow, amazing. Professor, you mentioned about corporate life cycle, right? Startups, growth, mature companies. It's like companies must act their age. Yeah. And then we hear this nice term called sustainability, which effectively means that you know companies can survive forever. They don't have to worry about their age. So the concept of life cycle then becomes rather controversial. So what's your take on that? There is what I call a theocratic trifecta. I do a session on this, you know. The theocratic tri trifecta uses, I'm talking talk about three words that have become these buzzwords. You know. One is ESG, the second is impact investing, the third is sustainability. I call them the theocratic trifecta because theocratic trifecta, you come from a position of virtue. You can't argue against it. This is what good people do. And in the process, I'm sorry? In the process, what tends to happen is people stop asking questions because who wants to be a bad person? I'm a dabbler. I have very little interest in deeply immersing myself in any topic. So for much of the last decade, I saw ESG mentioned, but I wasn't really that interested in it. In 2019, I decided to take a look at ESG, and I'll get to sustainability in a moment because it had I'd never seen a concept take off this much and get as much establishment buy-in at ESG did, right? McKinsey had bought into it. BlackRock with 11 trillion, and Larry Fink was talking about it. So I said, no, I want to see whether there's something there. So I went looking. And the more I looked, the less I found. Now, you've, you know what I think about ESG. I won't go there because it's going to be a tirade. But it's the most, it, it manages to pull off a really tough trick. It manages to be both empty and toxic at the same time. That's tough to do, right? If you're empty, nobody cares, but this is empty and toxic at the same time. In fact, if any of you work in ESG, I'm going to say something that you're probably not going to like. There are only two groups of people in ESG, useful idiots and feckless names. The useful idiots think that changing the world by working in ESG, the feckless knaves know they're not changing the world, but they make a lot of money anyway. Larry Fink, feckless knave. No debate here. A lot of McKinsey is joined in the game. So my 2019 is, I said, look, you guys keep talking about all this stuff, but then I go, look, there's nothing there. And that was my 2009. I started from a position of curiosity. 2020, I revisited the topic. But I said, if it's so empty, how come it's being pushed? And the answer became a cynical one. Remember the old legal saying, cui bono? Who benefits? Work backwards. So I said, who benefits from ESG? You've got ESG measurement services, right? Refinitive, sustain analytics. They feed their scores to investment funds, which create funds, ESG funds, which they charge. BlackRock on its carbon transitions fund, which is almost exactly identical to their regular, you know, regular ETF. 497 of the 500 stocks are in both funds, charges three times more. The fund managers then talk to the disclosure people because this system needs, so KPMG and Ernst & Young are loving this moment, right? Because they, this is another 100 pages and they'll have ESG specialists. And of course, companies now want to increase their ESG. And McKinsey says, we'll tell you how to do it. The gravy train is full of gravy. And I started identifying all of the people around and said, I see why ESG is being pushed. A lot of people are making money on it. And none of them can walk it back. I went from curiosity to cynicism. And then Russia invades Ukraine. And all of a sudden, I went beyond cynicism. Because remember, all of a sudden, what was going to get redefined because the world had shifted. One of my favorite news stories was actually a news story. That, you know, This is how the news story read. I cut it out right out of the Wall Street Journal. Philip Morris donates 500,000 cigarettes. If I stopped right there and I asked you to make an ESG judgment, Philip Morris already what? Bad company. Terrible cancer cause. You're giving away 500,000 cigarettes ads? Even worse, you're causing. 
to Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's starting to get murky, right? Ukrainians are the good guys. They're giving cigarettes to the good guys who are caught in those trenches. And you saw this after, you know, all of a sudden, you know, weapons manufacturers had to go from bad companies to good companies because it depended on who you sold the weapons to, right? Nuclear energy had came back from the dead because you didn't have enough fossil fuels because you were buying Russian gas. It's now cut off. I was beyond cynicism now. now I said, this is absolute chaos. And I wrote a piece in 2022 with the, with the, and I said, you know what? Don't expect ESG to go away, but expect it to get renamed and repackaged. There's too much money at play here. And I threw out a few suggestions and one of them was sustainability. But by itself, sustainability is a good word, right? We want the climate to be sustained. Why? Because we're all on the planet. We want the Earth. Oh, everybody. Do we want companies to make sustainable products? Absolutely. We want our shoes to last for longer. We want our computers. But sustainable companies, what does that even mean? So I was asked to actually give a talk a few weeks later to 50 chief sustainable... God only knows where all these... Are. CSO. So I, I said, what's a CSO? He's a Chief Sustainability Officer. And I said, what do they do? And nobody seemed to know. So I waited. These are 50 big companies. The CSOs all came in. It was an online session. So I said, what do you guys do? They're Chief Sustainability Officers. They look at each other. And... So I said, let me, let me you know, give, give you some, maybe some suggestions on what a CSO is and tell me which one of these fits. I said, maybe you're um, like Dalai Lama, right? You, you, you got this vision of what's good in the long term. Maybe the way you prepared for this, you went to a cave in the Himalayas, you, you spent five years, you developed it. No, maybe you're just deep thinkers. They look at me and said, no, that's no, not us. No. <laughs> I said, maybe you're like Jiminy Cricket in the Pinocchio movie. Have you ever seen the Jiminy Cricket is the conscience? Maybe you're there and you know, you're the conscience of the company. As a company, you can't do that, you can't do that. No. Or maybe you're like the people who used to do the mummies for the pharaohs. Remember the pharaohs wanted to live forever, you know, your job is to keep companies going forever. And the other, they, they had no idea what they were doing. And in a sense, that's I think the core problem of sustainability is, what are you sustaining? Is it the climate, is it the planet or, and products, in which case I'm with you. But if it's a company, what's the point of sustaining a company whose purpose is done? Do you want to sustain a tobacco company for the next 200 years, what exactly do you do? A company's legal entity. When the purpose for your existence is gone, you should leave. If you don't leave, you suck up resources and you end up like Europe. Europe is full of zombie companies, stomped out of their existence way back in the past, but they kept alive because somehow there's this vision of a company that dies is admitting failure. I think sustainability, people have to decide what exactly they're sustaining. Just don't give me that word and say, okay, you know, buy into it. It's a good word because from the perspective of business, I don't even know what it means. I don't think the people who push the word know what it means. So next time you hear somebody talk about sustainability, ask them what they're sustaining. Okay? What is it that you mean? By, they'll give you all kinds of baloney. But don't fall for it. Push them with specifics. What exactly would this mean in a retail company to be sustainable? Now, I give the example, you know, Gillette. What if, you know, what if you, Gillette could come up with a blade that lasted forever? This is good, right? What would happen to Gillette as a company? Remember, this is a company that makes its money not on the original razor, but on the blades. That's the kind of dilemma that you got to deal with. I, you know, if you look at what, where sustainability came, it came from a... Now, I think Harvard Business School exists 
to create buzzwords that consultants can sell. It's the only reason for its existence. To the, you know, the sustainability as a concept was born in Harvard Business School. It's packaged and sold, and I'm not surprised it has no substance because that's Harvard Business School. It's substance-free <laughs> and buzzword-rich. Consultants love it. In fact, I call Harvard Business Review the QAnon for consultants, right? Basically, you make up stuff and you sell it out there and consultants take and run with it. Okay? So I am, I'm waiting to see what's this. I actually, you know, I wrote about ESG in 2019, 20, and 21. I wrote about impact investing this year on my blog. But, you know, what exactly are you impacting? What's the biggest um, problem? Impact investing is about creating change in society while you invest, right? What's the biggest target for impact investing? What's been the biggest target over the last decade? Climate change, right? And almost five and a half trillion dollars has been impact investing in that purpose. You know what percentage of our energy came from fossil fuels in 2009? 82%. You know what percentage of our energy came from fossil fuels in 2023? 82%. So what the heck are you impacting? Where's all this green energy stuff showing up? So I said, if the definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome, impact investing is certifiably insane because what you claim to be impacting is not showing up. And their reaction was, we're spending so much money. Spending so much money doesn't stop climate change. It's creating energy that's not fossil fuel energy, right? So I argued that impact investing, there's something wrong with the process that's causing it not to have impact. Because it tries to do it through market mechanisms, right? And market mechanisms create counter effects. So one of the ways impact investing is supposed to work is you sell fossil fuel stocks. By doing that, you push down the price, you push up the cost of equity. You push up the cost of equity, they're supposed to invest less in fossil fuels. And it works, right? Public companies, oil companies. So they sell their, the key word is sell their fossil fuel reserves. Do you know the last 15 years, Private equity investors have invested $1.1 trillion in fossil fuel reserves that they're buying from fossil fuel companies like Exxon, Mobil, and Royal Dutch that impact investors are getting them to sell. Congratulations. Engine One, activist investing, got Exxon. They danced the, 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 look, we won. You know, we got Exxon, Mobil to sell it. No, you just moved it behind the curtain. So instead of Exxon Mobil developing these reserves, you have Carlyle developing the reserves. Good luck with you, because you've taken your, your, your oil reserves out of the hands of companies. We had at least a chance of influencing how they were developed and put it in the hands of some of the least scrupulous people on the face of the earth. And this is your definition of a win? So I've done ESG, I've done impact investing. Sustainability is next on my list. I've, I've already got enough enemies with ESG and impact investing to add to that list this year. And in fact, an FT article that I wrote that some of you might have read on ESG was the most read opinion piece in FT and not always in a good way for me, you know. So sustainability is next on my target list, and I'm coming for those guys. I'm really, you know, I, you know, I, because I want to know what, the, you know, what, what the substance here is. What exactly does it mean when you talk about sustainable? Yeah, because I don't think that until we get clarity on that, we can get any kind of substance to it. Professor, we really love your, you know, this infinite ability to share those anecdotes and analogies, you know, and share these complex things so easily. People. I have an infinite capacity to piss off people. <laughs> I've, lost, I've lost the censoring mechanism I might have had. I've, ne I've always had a weak censoring mechanism. It's now gone. It's one of the advantages of never having consulted in my life, never having formal relationships with any company is, I frankly stop caring. I'll say terrible things about Goldman Sachs and Larry Fink, and there's nobody who can pick up the phone and say, oh, you can't do that. So 
whatever you want to ask me, ask me because I'll give you exactly what's on my mind. No. I wish we had more time and we keep talking about these, so these not topics. I'm up the Adani group, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Please <don't want> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they are, correct. But anyway, we have to bring this fireside chat to a close. You know, thanks to our time. But thank you, Professor. That was really good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being patient listeners. That is Professor Ashwa Damodaran for you guys. Honorable guests, esteemed members, and Professor Aswad. On behalf of the organizing committee and all of us over here, I stand before you to express our deepest gratitude for taking out time and uh, sharing this uh, enriching insights and valuations. We as accountants also believe that we do finance and accounting, so half of us does agree with you. Uh, at the same time, we are incredibly grateful for you to taking out these interesting insights for the essentials. And of course, uh, we can hear you for hours. We can go through for days. But at the same time, whatever. <laughs> exactly. So some of us has been doing it, and I could really say that it will not uh, it will not be enough ever. Uh, at the same time, uh, I express uh, gratitude for the management committee to arrange the session and help us uh, gain these uh, valuable insights. The session has been uh, undoubtedly expect, uh, equipped us with uh, valuable tools and knowledge that will benefit us immensely. Once again, we express our heartfelt gratitude to Professor Aswad Damodran for his invaluable contributions to the session. We also extend our thanks to all the participants here. I now invite uh, C. Somnath and C. Nishant to please uh, hand over the uh, flower bouquet and a memento from all of us. I just request all the MC members also to come in and uh, take a good photograph. Yeah. I'll hand it over to Pratima for the next uh, round of these sessions. Our next speaker, Mr. Siddharth Bhaiya, is the founder, managing director, and CIO at Equitas Investment a boutique fund house that specializes in delivering outsized returns in the Indian public equity markets. He has over 21 years of experience in equity research and fund management and manages over $500 million of AUM across PMS, AIF, and offshore funds. We now invite him on stage to share his views on value investing. Thank you. Hi everyone. So I'm going to be talking about value investing today, right? And uh, that's something that's helped me. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant. So when Professor Damodaran talked about, you know, burning the midnight lamp, I remembered my CA final days. And that's when I remembered every, everyone else in the room would have gone through that phase <laughs> of five hours of sleeping, right? Uh, so we've all, uh, you know, how many of you are Interested in the equity markets, stock markets, everyone is invested here, probably everyone, right? So, uh, just a brief background about us. We started 10 years back. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've delivered 38% CAGR returns for our clients. What does 38% CAGR return means? That one crore invested with us is 225 crores. In dollar terms, we've delivered close to 34% CAGR returns. And there's one, one book, book which, which I've followed. followed. And, and which was, was one, one of the first book, book that, that is, is the Bible, Bible on investing, investing which, was which was published in 1934. Can, Can anyone, anyone name that book? book? 
Warren, Warren Buffett's, Buffett's guru. guru. Yes, yes, security, security analysis. analysis. And, and my, my first, first question, question to you today, today is, is how, how did it gram, gram and dot, and dot become, become irrelevant? This is, this is, this is an, historical an historical chart from, from 1879 to 1954. 1954. You look, you look at, at it, the average, the average yield, yield, dividend yield on stock at that point in time was more than 5%. So when Graham and Dodd espoused buying stocks at below net current asset value, or historically stocks were bought for dividend yields. So they weren't wrong at that point in time. They were right. But today it seems like an irrelevant uh, this, right? Uh, I'm, I'm a value investor. I'm a value investor. I run screeners on every quarterly basis. And do I find value? No, I don't. Right? It's a tough time being a value investor in today's day and age. This is the valuation for the Indian indices. Small cap is coding at 30p, Nifty is coding at 25. That's true for the S&P. I don't even want to talk about, uh, about the NASDAQ. The dividend yields today are less than 1%. We've all studied the dividend discount model. So effectively, if your dividend yield is 0.71, it'll take you 150 years if dividends don't grow to get back your investment value, right? So what's changed? What's changed as far as were Graham and Dodd wrong? No, I don't think so. So I'm going to take you through a very, very interesting concept of money supply, right? Before 1971, right, the world was on gold standard. And these are the valuations, and I'm talking about history, I'm not talking, see, don't look at the last 50 years as stock markets. You know, we've done business for hundreds of years before that. So we need to understand that in a greater context. This is from 1871 to 1964. This is the valuation. Your peak, peak P multiple for the S&P 500 was 20. That was bubble. Today that is baseline. This is from 1991 to 2021. It barely goes below 15. 15 is, 15 is bottom. Right, so what, what, what happened? So, let's go back to the gold standard, right? Before 1971, the world was on gold standard. So money supply growth was very stable. Money supply growth was linked to supply of gold or silver or this, right? So at that point in time, you know, interest rates were stable, inflation was stable. Was stable. There was, there were exceptions, of course. There were exceptions during wars and exigencies where you saw debasement of currency. But what did that do? That led to flight of capital. So anyone, whether you were victorious or whether you were a loser in war, you effectively faced financial ruin after that. So money supply growth before 1971 was very stable. You know, your great grandfathers, their lives were not driven by asset prices. All asset prices were linked to their productive yields. You bought stocks for dividend, that is why you got those dividend yields. You bought land for either rent or for the produce that it generated. You bought bonds for interest rates. I'll give you an example of how life was before that. Because money wasn't, wasn't getting created. And I'll, ta I'll take you through that, uh, you know, later on in our slide. You bought a farmland for $1,000. You tilled that land. You probably earned $100 out of that. You held the land for 10 years. And at the 10 years, at the end of 10 years, probably you sold the land for 1,100 rupees. That was how, how life was because money supply growth was very, very limited. Doing a DCA valuation at that time was very simple because not a lot of value was in the terminal value. Today, can you justify doing a DCA valuation for the small cap index when the index itself is quoting at 30 PE multiple and the dividend yields is 0.71 or for the NASDAQ or for NVIDIA? Can you do it? You can't do it. Simple, because you don't know. 20 years back, it was Intel, which was quoting at similar valuations. 
And if you did a DCA valuation at that point in time, trying to justify that Intel is going to grow at 25% for the next 20 years, you got it wrong. So today, a significant portion of valuation for stocks is in terminal value. What's the reason for this? Let's go to the next slide. This was the single biggest moment, according to me, in financial history, which was the abolishment of the gold standard. Before that, you know, you could actually go to the US government and say, here is my one dollar, give me gold back. 1971, Richard Nixon said, we are abolishing the gold standard. We are, you can no longer exchange. The US currency was backed by gold. 1971, they moved to fiat currency. They said, it's not linked to any more. It doesn't depend upon how much gold discovery happens or silver discovery happens or this. We are going to create money out of thin air. What's happened since then? Money supply in the last, and since 1971, has gone up 34 x So if you had, you know, if you had $100 back then, the value of, and if you just kept that currency, the value of that currency today is only $3. There's been a 97% erosion in the value of hard currency. It's reflected, it's, it gets captured in gold. Now it gets, it's getting captured in cryptos and I'll answer that also later on. But the value of gold has gone up 80x. This is in dollar terms. Value of gold since 1970. You think you're getting richer? Or is it just your salaries are increases or it's just the value of the money is getting devalued? Right, so what, what has this got to do with valuations? You're gonna ask me what has this got to do with valuation? So what we have to understand is money supply is a very recent, fiat money is a very recent phenomenon in the history of humanity. We've been around for billions of years and money supply is a 30 plus, 20, 50, 55 year phenomenon. Before that, you'd, you know, there was not a lot of wealth disparity. The wealth disparity was only if you were born in, in a kingdom. Okay, so post-1971, you've seen an explosion in money supply. Before that, if you look at it, before this, 1867 to 1954, there's hardly any money creation. Post that, post they moving to this, there has been an explosion. Next. So we're going to break this last 50 years into four eras. And it's very important to understand these four eras because that is when you will realize whether you've become rich because you're lucky or because you were working hard enough. The first era was a period of very high inflation, okay? Typically, 1971, the US government moved off the gold standard. All of a sudden, the money supply increased, right? When money supply increased, what does economics tell you? What does basic economics teach us? Basic economics teach us that it'll lead to inflation, right? That's, that's, uh, that is what is supposed to happen and that is what exactly happened. Inflation went through the roof. Inflation in the US hit 14%. This is the price of sugar, gold, corn, energy prices. The oil prices hit $84 in 1979. You know, adjusted for money supply, what should be the price of oil today? I'm not looking at standard measures of CPI and WPI because I'll explain it to you later that they are not the correct measures for uh, Is There was a pool of money, okay, let's say, $500 billion. At that point in time, it was $85. Today, the global money supply is 22 trillion. So what should have been the relevant price of oil? $550. Adjusted for money supply, don't look at inflation. I'll tell you why inflation is a wrong, wrong matrix to look at. So this is, what hap how, this is what happened. Textbook, money supply increasing, you know, inflation going through the roof and you know, the US entered a recession. In came Paul Walker, first phase, he took the US Fed rates to 20%. 
20%. The, o, the US Fed rate was 20%. Inflation was at 14%. At 20%, he broke the back of the US economy. Inflation fell rapidly, and US entered into a recession. Right? What happened in 19, 1981? We entered the second phase. First phase, inflation, money supply. Throughout this 40, 50 year period, money supply has been increasing. That is the only constant. Throughout this 50 year period, money supply has been increasing. That is the only. It broke the back of the US economy. 1981, interest rates at 14%. The S&P 500 was available at eight times trailing earnings the entire index. And then you are looking at an economy which is at 14% interest rates. That means corporate profitability was pathetic at that point in time. You're looking at record low margins. So the entire S&P 500 was available to you at eight times subdued earnings. That was the bottom as far as asset classes was, was concerned. Then from there, the money supply kept on increasing. See, 1980, it was shade under one trillion. By 2006, it had already hit eight trillion, the US money supply. <clears throat> and interest rates, post that, the interest rates kept on declining. And for all of it, we've been in a 40 year declining interest rate environment. Very important, I want you guys to remember this. We've been in a 40 year so nobody, nobody knows what 14% interest rates feel like or 20% interest rates feel like. What happened? What happened during this period? Okay, it was a slow, steady decline of, you know, this. During this period, interest rates kept on going down and money supply kept on increasing. Inflation was, you know, inflation was down the way inflation is me measured. To me, the way inflation is measured is also wrong. CPI and WPI, according to me, are bullshit measures of measuring inflation. And I'll explain it to you later on why. So this is the bond market from 20% going back all the way to 2020. So the period from, you know, sorry, go, go to the previous slide, please. Period from 1981 to 2009 was general prosperity, interrelation, not going through the roof at any point in time. It was, it was on a continuous uh, declining phase. And then it, cul uh, it culminated in the 2007-8 bubble as far as the stock market and the global economy is concerned. By that time, interest rates were zero, money supply had increased, and you had a, you had a bubble. And then happened the global financial crisis. Global financial crisis, you know, we were on the verge of bankruptcy. The, the global system was fairly, fairly complicated. What did Ben Bernanke do during the global financial crisis? Do you know what, uh, what was Ben Bernanke's speciality? As an, as an economist, he studied the Great Recession. And his biggest takeaway from the Great Recession was that print as much money as you can to save the world from a recession. So what did he do? He did exactly that. He printed money. The Fred's balance sheet quadrupled within a matter of one year. They printed money out of thin air. Okay. This is the money supply from 2001 to 2023. And you see a big jump, you know, uh, this. So there was a big jump as far as uh, money supply was concerned. Interest rates were brought down to zero. What would you expect when interest rates are brought down to zero and money supply is increased? You would, economics teaches us inflation. But guess what? 20, 2009 to 2020, inflation was zero. Wasn't it? There was, there was a period of nearly 0% interest rates for 10 years. It could have been 2%, but 2% or 0% is irrelevant. The whole point is, if you were a bondholder, you became relatively poorer. <clears throat> okay, what happens? Why? First and foremost, why did, why did, you know, okay, let's go back to this. What happens when your interest rates go to zero? 
here's the definition of cost of capital, which we've all studied during our FM course. Your risk-free return becomes zero, right? And then 10 years of near zero interest rates, all the asset prices were going up. Everybody around you was making money, right? Uh, and risk premium, according to me, you've been taught that risk premium is a fixed number. To me, risk premium is not a fixed number. In my 20 years of analyzing companies, I've seen that at peak profitability margins, company gets peak P multiple. So, you know, why, why were people buying cryptos and NFTs and NASDAQ in 2020 at the highest valuation? That highest valuations, as stock prices go up, you should demand more risk premium, right? But risk premium to me represents herd, herd mentality. It represents, you know, crowd psychology. So at the peak in 2020, your risk premium also became zero. So beta is irrelevant, right? Anything multiplied by zero is zero. So in 2020, peak 2020, your cost of capital was virtually zero. What happened? You got assets created out of thin air. You had NFTs. You know, people were paying money to buy Amitabh Bachchan selfies. Somebody was buying uh, land in you know, virtual, virtual this and paying millions of dollars. You had cryptocurrencies. See, cryptocurrencies are a creation of the Fed. Cryptos are a creation of, of the Fed. There's, there is a system out there. There is whether the valuation is justified or not. But the fact of the matter is if, if money supply was under control, cryptos would not have existed. So here you have falling cost of capital, asset prices going through the roof. Yet in 10 years, there was no inflation. Why was there no inflation? Because majority of the money post global financial crisis went into assets. And does, does WPI and CPI measure asset prices? Does the stock market, your housing, the value of your house get in this? So if you owned assets, you became richer. If you did not own assets, you became relatively poor. No inflation, world is, the Fed, the Fed and the central bankers are telling you for 10 years, no inflation. But I'm getting richer and somebody around me because I own a lot of financial assets. Luckily for me, I understood money supply much earlier than everyone else. So this is just housing plus stock as a percentage of GDP. I mean, not even adding commercial real estate. I'm not even as adding a lot of other assets. Right, I'm not adding cryptos. Crypto itself is three trillion or whatever. At the peak it was three trillion, today it is probably one and a half trillion. I'm not even adding a lot of these assets. I'm not adding gold, which is such a significant portion of global assets. This is just, this is your money supply growth from 1980 to eight. Your GDP has grown at eight X, but your asset prices have gone up probably 50 X, 60 X. So let's, let's recount first, First phase from 1971 to 79, you had high interest rates, you had high inflation, Fed increased interest rates, 1981, 40 years you've seen interest rates go down. You have seen no inflation because asset prices have gone up and asset prices don't capture inflation. So your CPI, WPI for the last 10 years has, been. then came the next thing. Go to the next slide. Then came COVID, right? COVID, 10 years, Fed was only printing money. Global money supply kept on increasing and interest rates for 10 years were at zero. And 10 years, they'd seen no inflation. So what did Fed chairman come and say? There's never going to be inflation again. We're going to print as much money as we want. Isn't it? Those were the words. And they said, no inflation. What happened post COVID? First wave, asset prices went up. But then the second wave, you had inflation. You had very high inflation because everyone was rich. Everyone was rich, everyone was sitting at home trading stocks, making money. You had massive inflation and Fed was caught aback. Everyone was caught. Nobody saw inflation hitting double digits. Not in the UK, not 
You can go back and see each and every statement. And every time they've said, inflation is not going to come and they were, they were surprised on the wrong side as far as inflation is concerned. So to me, markets are cycles. You had 40 years of asset owners making merry at the expense of factors of production. What are the factors of production? Labor, right? Materials, overhead costs. And I'm, I'm seeing that. A new airline has started in India, Kasa Airlines. What happened? All of a sudden, somebody, the demand in the airline industry is through the roof. What happened? Tata's just poached every one of their employees. Today, wage owners, owners are going to, are making a comeback. IT services, you saw in India, right? What happened 12 to 18 months back. All of a sudden, salaries which had not increased for 10 years, double, triple, quadrupled overnight. People were roaming around with four job offers in their hand. You're seeing hotels, right? You're seeing hotels making a comeback because room rents have gone through the roof. I came, I flew, you know. It's first time I tried booking Singapore Bombay and I think Singapore Airlines flies A380, which is one of the biggest aircrafts. There's not a single business class seat available. Historically, there have been times where you've looked at the price and said, oh my God. But here, forget the price, there was not a single seat available. So, now the cycle is about to change as interest rates go up. Everyone feels that inflation is going to go down. My sense is inflation is not going down because you have had a change in cycle. The factors of production are going to demand. As interest rates go up, the value of your assets is going to go down. People for 10 years were very happy not getting any salary increases because they were making money out of ESOPs. Now a lot of ESOPs have become worthless. So this cycle, according to me, is going to change. Are we going to get back to an era of Graham and Dodd where we're going to see assets below net current assets, stock prices below net current Probably not because money supply creation is not going to happen. So the most important thing you have to understand is one, the creation of money supply. And second is that as inflation keeps on increasing, it will have an impact on asset prices. At 0%, you could have justified any valuation and which is what people did with startups, with cryptos, with NFTs. But at 10 and 11%, bonds are going to make a comeback. People, are, asset prices are going to go down you are going to have a reversion to mean. So a lot of people from a valuation perspective are going to learn some tough lessons over the next 10 to 15 years. So that's, that's again, coming back, this is an important slide, bubbles, right? You might say that, okay, even before money supply was there, there were bubbles one day. You, we've all heard about the South Sea bubble and the Mississippi bubble. And both these bubbles nearly bought the United Kingdom in chaos and on the verge of bankruptcy. So what was it? How much did the South Sea bubble stock go by? 10x. That's it. The Mississippi bubble, the Mississippi stock went up by 20 times. And here's a comparison for the small cap index. The small cap index in the last three years has gone up by six times, five and a half times in India. More than 700 stocks have gone up more than 10x in the last three years. Why? So this is growth, that was bubble. This is money supply, that was life without money supply. And John Law was the first one who printed paper money, which led to the creation of South Sea Bubble. Right, so yeah, that's, that's about it from my end. So my expectation is over the next 15 to 20 years, you're going to see a correction in asset prices, money supply has already been created, that money will go from the assets to the factors of production, which would be wages, which would be you know, rentals, which could be yields on property, uh, yields on commodity prices, and it, it will be a gradual process. It will not happen overnight, but it will happen over a 25, 30 year period. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you, Mr. Siddharth. And uh, the next. Okay.
uh, we'll have the next. Uh, okay, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Siddharth, uh, for your valuable insights on value investing. And I'm sure some of our members would uh, like to have a chat with you regarding your views on uh, why you feel the inflation rate is not calculated and it, uh, as per how it is calculated right now. So we mo moving on to our final section, we would like to invite CA Gandharv Jain and CA Amrish Garg, uh, who are not new to ICA Singapore, by the way. Uh, they are the founding partners of Finvox Analytics. Each of them have over 16 years of experience in fundraising, M&A advisory, business valuations, restructuring, purchase price allocation, and valuations of complex instruments. Their firm, Finvox, is a research and analytics firm specializing in commercial, portfolio, and insolvency valuation, and financial advisory services. So let us hear from them. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you are enjoying these sessions and the I think Professor Damodaran opened the session and it's a privilege for us to be a, a co-speaker in the in the session that uh, Professor Damodaran has opened. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the ICI Singapore Managing Committee for having us here, inviting us for this evening. Uh, it was great to hear uh, Siddhartha Bhaiya. I think the, the insights were really great. Some of us don't think about all of this in our daily lives, but I think you are now forcing us to think about inflation and how it will impact the valuation in the coming time. So thanks for that. Uh, to introduce ourselves, uh, we are a valuation firm. Uh, we have our offices in Canada, Singapore, US, and India. India being our delivery center. Um, both me and Amrish co-founded Ifinvox in 2015, and uh, uh, we started this. Now we are a 50 plus people team. Uh, we are uh, mostly... Uh, we both chartered accountants, uh, part of uh, ICI, uh, and uh, I'm a CPA, I'm a CFA. We're practicing valuation and advising our clients, helping them in uh, complying with their uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, today we have a session uh, wherein I think last year we came in about the same time in October 2022. And then we spoke about the difference between valuation of startups. This, this is again, we are, we are talking about valuation of startups. But last year we spoke about uh, the difference between value and price and how, how founders pitch to the investors to get the right price. This year we are focusing more upon uh, how the, uh, how the um, uh, deal terms impact the valuation. So what is the game beyond the numbers? So that's, that's what we will be discussing uh, and what, what, how the investor rights impact the value. Yeah, so... Uh, so I think uh, uh, that's what our topic, our topic for the day. And uh, uh, hi, good evening, everyone. So last time when we came here, we discussed like what's the key driver for the pricing of a startup, and we we discussed that it's the growth story and the narrative of the startup which really defines the underlying price of any startup. And the growth story basically includes the market potential, the industry size, the strength of the team, the problem solving product which any startup has, underlying tech which enable them to grow multifold. So these are the key factors which really define the growth story and the price of any startup. But I'm sure you still wonder that there are many such startups who still have to monetize, have to really find a model to monetize their product. They have to really find the actual right product fitment they really have to find a correct business model. But still, in their funding grounds, they get million dollar valuation, they get billion dollar valuation. So what are the, those, those things which really uh, enable them to get that price? So today in next 30 or maybe like in 20 minutes, we're going to discuss that what are the key terms. So based on our experience of valuing startups, based on our, upon our experience of negotiating uh, funding transaction for any startup, what are the key terms basically which bridge the gap between the fundamental value and the deal price of startup. So broadly we are going to discuss about two important rights there. One is the liquidation preference and second is anti-dilution rights. There are other rights also exit rights, affirmative rights, but given the time we have, we are broadly going to touch upon the liquidation preference first and then the uh, anti dilution right that how these two clauses which are very critical which are somewhere written the term sheet most of the 
time founders just ignored them. But there are the two critical clauses which has a direct impact on the valuation, direct impact on the founder's stake, and it's very important to really understand and eye on it. So we are going to cover it today. So yeah, so I think uh, most of you would be thinking that uh, how the investors give these uh, startups who are at their uh, young age, as Professor Damodaran told us that uh, they're still uh, trying to build, how they are able to give the valuation, right? So billion dollar valuations are being given to companies who don't have systems and processes, may not have the right uh, kind of uh, 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 you can say the system ecosystem around them to get that kind of a valuation so the the most important part is the investor rights the rights that the investor get uh, and how they play on those rights to protect their value that is something which protects investors deal price the value that the the investors give to these startups and one of the most important out of the, all the rights that these investor get is liquidation preference so despite the fact that uh, the, the founders have got a wealth of resources available to them at the time of the fundraising, I think it is very important to understand the, the term sheet clauses. And uh, liquidation preference is one of those clauses which actually uh, makes the uh, founders and the, and the investors talk about a prospect of, a, of an event where uh, the, the exit may not happen at the desired, desired price. So they may have to allocate the value amongst themselves uh, and how the investors will be protected when that value allocation happens. So how the risk between the various counterparties will be allocated. That's what liquidation preference is. And uh, in, in our experience of valuing companies across globe, this is one of the most negotiated clauses where the founders and, and the investors uh, negotiate hard in terms of who will get what kind of liquidation preference because this is what decides that what what will be the exit price? So often it is. It happens that uh, if the if this liquidation preference is not structured well, founders find them uh, themselves in a situation of unfavorable uh, exit payout structures. Right. So that is something which I think uh, 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 we will explain going ahead. That how different types of liquidation preferences impact the value uh, or the price of a deal. So I think there is no need to explain who is the founder here. So therefore, it's important that you understand, the founder should understand to avoid this positioning. Uh, so we are going to discuss about the two type of liquidation preference. So the two, two type of liquidation preference which are basically uh, available in the industry right now to distribute the waterfall. And it's important to understand how the le legal language is written because you know all the lawyers are very smart and they, they really write a language which is dif difficult to decode. So very important to understand that what's the difference between non-participative liquidation preference, what's the, what, what is participative liquidation preference, and how the language is different between two of them and how it impacts the value. So we'll first speak about the non-participative liquidation preference. So basically the clause will read like in any term sheet or in any uh, shareholders agreement that in case of any liquidation event, and liquidation event does not mean that the company will actually shut down. Liquidation event me, uh, almost cover all the exit events uh, except IPO. So assuming if there's a sale of a company, then how the consideration will be distributed between the investors and the founders. So here the clause will say that the investor will get its investment amount or amount equivalent to their proportionate share into the company, whichever is higher. So here, either the investment amount or the value for their proportionate stake into the company, whichever is higher, investor is going to get in the uh, in case of distribution. So this is non-participative, where it will higher of two amounts. But in case of participative liquidation preference, the language says that after the investment amount is returned back to the investor, then the existing shareholders will participate in whatever amount is left. I, I'm, right now I'm just in, uh, discussing the legal language. We'll explain through the example also that how it impacts. But the, the difference between the two is that in case of non-participative, the investor will get investment amount or the proportionate stake, whichever is higher. But in case of participative liquidation, the investor will get his investment amount back 
first and whatever amount is left will be distributed between the uh, shareholders. So therefore, in the case of participative liquidation, the investment amount is it's broadly protected because they, they, they are going to first get the investment amount back. So this is the difference between the two. Now I'll take an example here, uh, a practical example which we do quite often uh, to value many companies. So we have valued many startups where we have implemented uh, uh, this this kind of methodology to really work out what's the actual value of the company if we consider the impact of liquidation preference. So now take a scenario where there is a there is a, there is an investor and he invested ten million dollars into a company for one third stake or like thirty three percent stake into a company which translate to a post money valuation of 30 million. So the facts is that the post money valuation of the company is 30 million, investor has invested 10 million for 33 percent stake and the value for convertible preference share is hundred dollars. These are the few facts. Now assuming like if, if there's no liquidation preference here and if the company is sold say for 10, 10 million value only instead of 30 million if the company is sold for 10 million because of this no liquidation preference, ultimately investor is, go is going to get only 33%, which is like 3 million here, and balanced founders will get. So the value of investor, 10 million, the amount which they invested reduces decline to 3 million if the company is sold for 10 million. So because of, like this is a case where there's no liquidation preference. So therefore we can say post money value of 30 million is equal to the implied equity value and both preference and equity share their par. So this is a situation without liquidation preference. Now move to a second situation carrying on the same example. If there's a non-participative liquidation preference of 1x, it means that the investor will get back either the $10 million or its proportionate stake into the company, whichever is higher. This is the non-participative liquidation preference. So we'll see how the distribution waterfall will work here. So uh, assuming like if, if the company sold for 10 million in this case, the, the, uh, the distribution up to 10 million will go to the investor. So therefore, here now investor is protected. If the value is below 10 million, the entire amount will go to the investor and nothing will go to the common shareholder or the founders. So therefore, up to 10 million investor will go, is going to get the first tranche of distribution. The moment value increases, up to 30 million, the second tranche belongs to the founders or common shareholders. This is how the distribution work. And beyond 30 million, which was the post money value at which investor invested, then both founder and the common shareholder, or investor and the founder, they're going to share whatever is left in their respective proportion. So this is how the distribution waterfall will work. And so there's a method called option pricing model which we apply to really capture the impact of liquidation preference. And if we apply that model, the implied equity value in that case will be 22 million. So what happened, like you must have seen whenever any funding round happened, it's only the 30 million value, a post money value which, which is published in the newspaper and we, we believe that the company has worth of 30 million. But because of this liquidation preference, the value is not 30 million, rather actual value of that company, the implied equity value based upon that funding round is, is only 22 million. And if we further allocate that value between different classes of shares, because preference shares have, uh, the preference shares were issued at $100, the value of equity share would be $60 only. Though we, we believe that if someone is buying shares at $100, then the common shareholder which is there, his value will be also 100, but that would be a case in case of no liquidation scenario. If there is a non-participative liquidation, then the effective value for common shares would be $60, not $100. And you can see it's a delta of almost 40%. And this is one thing I, I believe in most of the IPOs which have happened for startup companies, like everywhere the benchmarking happened with the post money. Whenever they, they came with a price uh, in, in their prospective, they, they always benchmark like this is this was the previous round at which common shares were uh, preference shares were issued but in case of ipo the the liquidation preference is basically abolished so there's no liquidation preference for any equity shareholder so therefore one cannot benchmark the price of the previous funding round of preference shares with the common shares and and that was the main reason uh, where the, the valuation correction happened uh, in, in case of many startup tech companies which got listed but along with other reasons. So if we look at the participative, in case of participative, what happened? The first 10 million will go to the investor. 
then they will participate in whatever is left. So you can see here, they like immediately beyond 10 million, both common and investor, they participate. So assuming like if the company sold for 30 million itself, this is the value at which investor had invested. How much investor is going to get 10 million? Balance 20 million is left. So investor is going to get 7 million additional. So though he invested 10 million, he's taking away 17 million in this case. And if we apply the same option pricing model method or other methods, the equity value works out to be $28. And you can see it's a delta of 72%. So you can see the impact of this clause, liquidation preference on the value of any company. And, and it's basically, it's the 30 million value which it's published in, in the newspapers. And we have always believed that this is the value of company, but we never deep dive into what was the liquidation preference clause, whether it was non-participative, participative, and what's the true value of that company. So if we summarize, uh, we can see that uh, 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 there's a difference in the value between paripasu non-participative and participative. And if you have a participative liquidation preference, uh, then obviously uh, the value will be impacted the most for, for the founders, right? So, the, so uh, this is one of the clauses which I think uh, can be uh, a, a deterrent to a deal breaker also. And you have to be very careful. Uh, and when, when we do valuations, this is the most, uh, you can say, uh, thing, the, the, the complex thing that, that you have to, you have to factor into, into your, uh, into your valuation engagements, because we have seen most complex capital structures coming out of, because of the, of the complex liquidation preference clauses or a distribution waterfall, because, uh, we all see that all of these startups are now raising funds and the series are going up to F G H I J K L. So it's like all the investors will have different kind of liquidation preferences kicking in and you will have to compute the value of each investor separately. So like, like if, for example, if the, if the value of the company is say hundred dollars, uh, it may not be a case where every investor will have similar value, even between the investors, the, the, the investors which have invested first may have a higher value and the investor, which are investing later may have a lower value or vice versa, depending upon how they have negotiated their, their term sheets. Right. So, and that is, that is where we also get a lot of, a lot of work. It's like 409 evaluations that we do in us where we have to compute the value of the common stock and we have to allocate the value looking at the distribution waterfall and liquidation preferences of any company. Uh, now coming to the second uh, uh, right, which which is the most uh, you can say us right. So now what what is an anti dilution clause? Somebody from the audience can tell me. Anybody can raise hand and maybe tell me. Most of you would have looked at it at some of the term sheets that that you would have seen. Emptive rights which the investor gets, which basically gives them the right to invest in the company at at uh, first at the same same price and second is anti-dilution which basically protects the investor from a down round we we all have seen down round down rounds happening uh, in the companies pre-covid post-covid right depending upon what sector the company is in right and whenever a down round happens uh, the value of the investor who has invested first and taken the most risk at the time when the company was establishing itself is impacted right so therefore the any good investor who 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 is giving high valuation to any startup and that's what we are saying is the difference between the fundamental value and the deal price would want to have a tight anti dilution clause in their favor so that even if the value of the company becomes equal to the value of the money that they had invested at least they get their money back right so this is those one of the clauses which which protects the investor from uh, from from a, a value uh, from a getting a lower value in any down round, which happens in the future rounds of financing for a for a for a startup. So basically, this is this is these are the stalwart guardian clauses is what we what we call them because these are the protective clauses and uh, they they basically protect the integrity of the of the value of the investor and and give them of of the uh, stress that they may have of the future financing rounds. Uh, you you all must be wondering why why it is why we are referring it to as an unloved child, right? So we have picked it up from a from a obviously a, a note or a blog that somebody has written. But the that there are two there are two ways of looking at it. One is that when I am coming to the next slide, you will see that there is some kind of a mathematical calculation involved 
uh, when you are phrasing these uh, anti dilution clauses so there are different types of uh, anti dilution uh, rights a full ratchet uh, a narrow based a broad based which has a lot of mathematical calculation to make and lawyers while drafting the the term sheets uh, just hate this because they are not like number guys so they don't want to get into what is broad based what is narrow based so that is why it is called a unloved child also from a founder's perspective if you look at it uh, because of this clause the most impact that will come to is the founder because the founder will have to dilute its interest in favor of the investor to to give them uh, the protection against the down round price so from a founder's perspective again this this clause is, is a kind of a unloved child so that's uh, now uh let's dive into maybe uh, for next 2 3 minutes i'll try to explain that what are the different types of anti dilution and how they impact uh, the um the value or the or the stake that the that the uh, investor gets in any company when there's a down round what happens to the stake of the investor so there are broadly uh, three types of uh, anti dilution rights uh, one is a full ratchet now this by full ratchet we mean that whatever will be the hit in the in the interest or the stake or the percentage holding of the investor would be borne by the founder so for example if my company got funded at 100 million dollar by investor in in a series a round and series b is happening at say 50 million dollar then the entire difference between whatever should be the hit so in say for example my investor had a had a 10% interest in the company right and now in the down round that interest will come down to say 5% for example i'm just giving you a very broad example though we'll come to the numbers we have also have numbers on these uh, in the next slide but i'm just giving you a very rough example so this hit of 5% will be taken by the in, by the founder and not by the uh, series b uh, series a investor right because series a investor will remain at 10% and whatever is the differential between uh, the uh percentage holding will be taken by the founder so founder will come from will go from 90 to 85% just for a broad understanding then there are two uh, different uh, clauses weighted average broad based and narrow based now broad based mean that uh, uh, this is again a mathematical calculation we don't have the time to get too much deep into it but what i can tell you is that broad based means that uh when when we do, when we are doing a, a weighted average of the earlier shares it will be weighted by the fully diluted shares before the down round right and in narrow based it is only weighted by the number of shares in the prior round so the impact in narrow based is more than the impact in the broad based because broad based typically gives you a protection and the founder is less impacted when narrow based it is more impacted let's let's do some numbers here uh i'll try to maybe explain you by numbers so we have to get simple case study it's a base case where there is no down round the seed round happened at a, a price of 100 where the seed investor invested uh, 100 shares in 100 shares and got a interest of 9% in series a round again uh, it was done at 100 and uh, uh, basically uh, the uh, interest of the founders the percentage share holding of the founders and the uh seed investor was diluted and series a investor got 8.33% so this is a base case where there was no down round it was like a same price at which the second round happened now let's take a case study where the down round happened right so when when the down round happened at say 50 the earlier round was at 100 how did the percentage share holding for the founder got impacted uh, got affected in these three scenarios basically broad based narrow based and full ratchet so if you look at it what happened was that in 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 a broad based calculation of anti dilution the founder will only have to let go 0.6% of his of his uh, share holding in narrow based it will be 3.4% and in full ratchet which i said was a full protection for the investors the founder will have to let go of 6.6% of the share holding right so here if you look at it in full uh, basically in full dilution so let's let's come back so this was a base case scenario now if we go back in a in a in a full dilution scenario your series a investor will be at 15.38 your uh, seed investor will be 7.69 and your founder will be at 76.92 and now look at full ratchet what is happening here your founder ha has gone below to 
right? So the entire hit has been taken by the founder. So this is one of the clauses where which gives which gives the uh, right to the investors to protect their value. And in, now why these are important from a valuation perspective. Now we we have. Uh, we'll, we'll also have a case study which Amrish will take, but I will just try to take one minute to explain you why it is important from a valuation perspective, because we are all in the world of IFRS and NDS, right? So typically what is happening is that all of the balance sheets of all the companies are being fair valued and we have to actually assign a value to these rights which the investor have and actually bring, it, bring them up to the balance sheet of the company maybe on the liability side. Most of you would have seen that uh, liability for an ESOP is recorded in your in your annual uh, accounts. Similarly, valuation for all of these rights, which is basically your entity dilution or maybe uh, 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 other rights are being recorded now on the balance sheet. We have done valuations for entity dilution where uh, we have been asked to value the this right specifically. Yeah, so we are going to now discuss a one practical case study. So this is a e-grocery company where we were associated with this company from their very first funding round in 2014 through their sale of company to, one, uh, to, to a large listed entity. So during this entire journey from 2014 to 2022, we were associated with them in form of helping them in fundraising in valuation. So therefore, we could share that practical insight what happened with that company, how investor gave away huge number, the correction happened, it came back. And so this anti-dilution right really give a lot of comfort to the investors for giving very high value because they know that if the tomorrow value gets corrected, they are not impacted. They, they will effectively get back their uh, uh, excess stake into the company. So this is a company uh, into e-grocery. You might have heard about Grofers in India. Uh, so this is a case study about that Grofer. So in 2014, uh, September 2014, they had the first funding round where we helped them in negotiating the term shift with Sequoia. So, the company was started more as a B2B inventory management and logistic solution provider to the small retail grocery stores. So they were basically fulfilling the demand of small retail grocery stores at that point of time. So they created a platform where any uh, grocery store could basically uh, say that they, they want X number of uh, items and then they were connecting them with the large merchants and they were delivering those goods. So that was the stage of company mainly B2B uh, focusing mainly on the grocery stores and they raised uh, half million. Then suddenly like the, the, the founders realized that they already have a platform which is being used by uh, grocery stores. Why don't open that platform for larger audience so that the end consumer can also place orders and they can then fulfill the demand of end consumer, any grocery item demand for end, uh, end consumer. And that was a time and you must have heard the, the buzzword hyper local on demand logistics. So that was the time late 2014 early 2015 that in the industry for hyper local on demand really it came up and and Grofer was, was one of the company who took advantage of that industry momentum so they were able to create a narrative because grocery at that time was valued almost 600 billion dollars so so they were basically target was targeting a industry which was a huge market potential they had experience of delivering grocery items from one place to another. They have expert team. There was a moment in the market. So that, that was a phase like during that one year, they were able to raise more than $170 million. Many big investors, Tiger Global, uh, SoftBank, they jump uh, and they, they pump a lot of money. Uh, and, and you can see like the value of the company here, it was for. $14.9 uh, for the Series B in Feb 15. Within a period of like nine months, it jumped by almost five times. And, and at the $73, like everyone were bullish about on-demand logistic, hyper-local, and, and, and there are many companies which jump into in this industry. Then the realization come to investor, because when they really deep dive into the model of hyper-local, they understood that there was no business model at all. Like, take a situation for delivering an item which was $10, of the ticket size of an order was $10, where they were making a margin of only 5 to 6%. So ultimately, by delivering one item from grocery store to the end consumer of $10, they would make, like the company would make only 50 cents. But to deliver that item, they were incurring almost 4 
four dollars as a delivery cost. They were incurring four to five dollars as a customer acquisition cost, and then there's tech team and everything. So, for that ten dollars <coughs> item, they were incurring almost ten dollars itself and making only fifty cents as a gross, so almost a loss of nine and half dollars. So, when investor really understood this business model, they realized that this business model can't work, and and therefore the correction happened in the market. For next almost two years, two and a half years, the growers really tried to raise more funds. There was no take for that story. During that period, many other companies who jumped into the on logistic, on demand, uh, uh, hyper local logistic industry, many vanished from that play. And ultimately, in 2018, uh, March 2018, growers were able to raise another funding round, Series E, but that happened at a significant down round. And at that point of time, the Series D investor were issued additional shares to the extent, without any consideration, bonus shares to the extent that their weighted average price reduced from 73 to 35. So ultimately, investor was able to reduce its acquisition price. It's the, it's the founder who ultimately take the entire plunge and that's why the founder become an unloved child in that case. Because like for, for investors, founder is the, is the most loved one but anti-dilution is something with they, they can't do anything. They really have to do a stepchild treatment with them because investors have to really protect their right first. And this is what happened with them. But good thing is that at least at that point of time, founders to that call that if it hits their stake at this stage, they could again revive the company. That happened. And finally, in 2022, at a very good valuation, that company was sold to Zomato and they get a good exit and they were able to give good exit to all the investors. So, but that was a phase where anti-dilution really impacted a lot to, to all the investors. And this is something which really gave a lot of lesson. Like when, whenever we were doing valuation for this round, we were always like thinking, what, what is happening here? How come a company becoming 5x in its value within a period of nine months? Uh, what will happen if it gets corrected? We never took anti-dilution clause in our valuation at that point of time. But this, this was a learning for us that definitely anti-dilution is also very important and we should consider into our valuation. So this is our practical experience on anti-dilution. So uh, I think uh, what, what we take pride in is that uh, we have been involved with Blinkit, what you call now, from the round one and we have been part of all of these funding rounds, issued valuation reports and uh, Blinkit also has got a holding company in Singapore which we also do value. So we're very closely involved and we have seen the cycle and uh, we know how, how it impacts the valuation. Uh, we'll take just five minutes more. I think uh, Somnath will take just five minutes more and close this. So uh, I think uh, next is exit rights. Uh, there's, there's a waterfall mechanism which is generally there, which means that uh, uh, first is obviously the IPO, which never used to happen in startups, but lately this has started to happen. Now in India, at least we are seeing a lot of IPOs happen in Zomato, Nike, ATM, all of these startups, uh, recently Mama Earth made its IPO, right? So this is the kind of a, a waterfall mechanism where, um, where the investor tries to protect again uh, their exit, wherein they ensure that if nothing happens, they, they have to exit because fund has got its own life cycle of 10 years or 12 years and they have to exit after that. So they, they have tried to take all of these rights where if IPO does not happen, then secondary sale will happen or strategic sale will happen. If nothing happens, buyback will happen either from the company or from the promoter, right? And we have seen a practical case scenario where the buybacks have happened. So if you look at it, uh, these are a couple of scenarios where actually the buyback have happened and the investors have forced the, uh, the, the, the founders to, take, to, to buy this stake because they have to make an exit. First is the case of uh, OYO. <coughs> so basically first is the case of OYO where OYO, I think uh, there have been a lot of people said that they, the investors forced them but some people say that the founder wanted to give exit to the, to the, uh, to the investors. So both Sequoia and uh, Lightspeed were given an exit in 2019 which was just before COVID and the investor, uh, the founder Ritesh Agarwal, he actually bought the stake. Uh, it is also some somewhere said that SoftBank instigated it and they wanted uh, the other investors to exit. There are all stories. Uh, but what happened was actually Ritesh Agarwal bought the stock uh, from these investors. He took loan from uh, Nomura and Mizuhu. And uh, in 2019, he, he gave an exit of and, and shelled out $1.5 billion where these investors made at least 20, 25x to 30x on their initial investment.
and obviously then in 2020 we all know what happened covid happened and the uh, business model kind of tanked and uh, that's where there were statements coming in from Mitesh Agarwal that he would have, if he would have not done this, he would have actually uh, bought it at a cheaper price. But nobody knows what happens in the future. Then second is obviously Mu Sigma. Now again, this is one company which has been now profitable, but the IPO has not happened. But obviously the Sequoia and uh, General Atlantic have to take an exit because they invested in this company in 2011. And uh, they tried all means, IPO, secondary sale, strategic sale. Everything was 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 uh, in, uh, initiated, but they failed. So ultimately, they had to take an exit. And because of the fact that there was a buyback clause in the term sheet uh, for the founder, which is a very important clause, as we have been saying, they were able to take an exit from this company, though at a smaller multiple of 2.5 to 3x, but still they were able to exit. So therefore, there's a high importance. Again, here, uh, I think the, the, the it was a debt-funded deal where... Uh, uh, the, the founder took debt, debt and paid off the investors. So again, what we are saying is that uh, primarily what is important is investor rights, right? This is one of the last slides that we have for today. So how there are some other smaller rights which are there, uh, but how they impact the valuation. Yeah. So basically what happened through these uh, affirmative rights and other investor rights which are given in the term sheet. So investor effectively get a de facto control over the company. And you all know, like, whenever there's an acquisition transaction and buyers acquire control, there's a general thumb rule that there's, there would be a control premium, anything ranging between 15 to 25%, depending upon what's the deal. So here in this case, by having affirmative rights, where the investor basically says that without investor's permission or their confirmation, that they can't take major decision into the company. And then there are other rights like drag along, where the investor says that if tomorrow to sell this company to any third party or even to a strategic buyer where the majority stake has to be transferred then investor even though investor has a minority interest has a right to drag the shares of the founder so that the majority could be transferred to the uh, potential strategic buyer so su such are the rights which basically give them de facto control and therefore somewhere that control premium, which we generally see in m and transactions, somewhere get embedded into the deal price also because of this uh, these terms. So here we are just summarized uh, on uh, what all these rights are, and uh, there are there are uh, valuation methods available to value these rights. We are doing it on a day in and day out basis, where we are being asked to do it on a from a financial reporting perspective or from a deal price perspective. Uh, we would have done a lot of valuations for companies like Grofers, Bharat Pay, where we have applied back solve option pricing models to value the liquidation preferences and allocate the value between different classes of shares. Uh, we have done the uh, valuation of the anti dilution right for uh, TSG group, uh, where again we had applied binomial model basically to value the uh, call option that the that the investor had to to value how the anti dilution was there. Uh, we have done a lot of valuation for uh, the exit option, which is basically the buyback by applying all of these binomial and methods and then the control rights. So there one, I'll just, sorry to interrupt in the level between, between for an exit option, I'd like to highlight one point which you might have seen. So what happened because of IFRS and there was a buyback clause written in the agreement where there was an obligation on the company to buy back. The entire investment in preference shares, they were reclassified as liability. So therefore, all the CFOs of startup companies, when the IFRS got implemented into them, they were surprised to see their balance sheet themselves, where like they, they raised money which was quasi-equity, some way it was equity, it was preference share, so it should be uh, classified as equity capital. But accountants, what they did, they reclassified as a liability at that to at a fair value. So therefore, the entire balance sheet basically look as a balance sheet which is full of liability, no equity, and, and this clause really made them think that how they could rectify the situation. Therefore, now you would see in a lot of the term sheets, now there's no buyback on the company. There's a buyback only on the promoter and they take away this clause of buyback on the company because it really impacts the balance sheet. So this is the practical what we have seen now. I think as Professor, Professor Damodaran was saying that the balance sheet has got a note, lot of notional assets. There's also a notional liability which is coming in because of this buyback clause which is there on the company. Yeah, so it depends so, upon uh, what are the 
convergent term. So if it is like a compulsory convertible, then it will go on the other equity. Otherwise, it will come in the liability. So, but typically, all of these investors, or what we are talking about, typically invest in a CCPS structure, which is a compulsory convertible preference share. So therefore, it comes as a liability in the balance sheet rather than looking. Uh, uh, it is an equity, but because of this clause, it becomes a liability. But otherwise, it's compulsory convertible. So in our entire presentation, preference share means it's compulsory convertible preference share. So, so uh, I, I, we wanted it to be a more engaging session, honestly, but because of the time crunch that we had today, we were not able to engage much with all of you. I think, uh, and again, I think we, I don't know whether we have time for Q&A or not. So Mnath will only tell. Yeah, so I but think uh, maybe on, 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 on dinner yeah. we'll, we'll have Q&A. Yeah, so, so on <laughs> dinner we can have some Q&A. Anybody <laughs> who, of you who wants to have a discussion, we are open for a discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for that insightful session. Um, may I call uh, uh, Nishant and Som, along with our speakers, uh, back to the stage, please. The first set of Professor Ashwat Damodaran. We all had privilege and honor to hear him in life. I'm sure most of us will take one or two nuggets which will help us to do valuation, not pricing, as he said, for the rest of our lives. For me, I picked up 3P. Then we had our own... Uh, Amrish and Gandhav have become families for us now. And, and we hope that Siddharth also becomes So it's a subtle hint that please do come back again, please. But we had a great engaging session, thanks to all three of you. We all learned a lot. Amrish and Gandhar we have heard before also, and they are absolutely fantastic, and that's why see so many of us repeated today. But Siddharth, you also captivated a lot of them. And uh, I'm sure many of us will be uh, catching hold of you. <laughs> you chose the right time to say, speak these words. <laughs> Without taking f further time and being uh, a barrier between you and dinner, may I request you to clap once again for all the people involved in <laughs> managing the event. I'll just like to say one uh, last line. The strength of togetherness, which really imbibes our chapter and keeps us all glued to each other to soar near heights. With that,